All right, good morning everyone. Today is day eight of the Rankin Technical College online AWD 1100 C-Sharp programming class for the summer 2023 semester. Today I'm going to go over four of the problems. Um, we're going to talk about the Pig Latin one last. I'm not going to make you do that, but I am going to go over how it's done. All right, and we're going to go over three of the other problems. Um, and when I get done with that, I'm going to introduce the material that we're going to cover next week. OK, so the plan today is to go over in detail. Um, two or th three of the homework problems and one of the lab problems. When we get done with that, we will very quickly get introduced to what we'll be covering next week in Chapter 7. All right, now remember there is no class. So you have a test, okay, the second hands-on test, hot number two on chapters four through six will be given Tuesday. I will email you the test by 7 a.m. I will go over the test from about 8 a.m. till 8.15 a.m. And then it'll be due as a GitHub repo by midnight on Tuesday. All right, and if you're interested, then Wednesday of next week, we're going to go over chapter seven. Thursday, we'll go over chapter eight, just so you have an idea of what's going on. Please remember that the chapters four to six, written tests, homework, and labs, and we'll go over what all those are in a bit. They're all due Wednesday, the 31st of May, and again, your hands-on test will be due by midnight Tuesday, the 30th, okay? All right, they're doing some work outside in my house and it should be done very quickly, um, probably within five minutes. So if you do hear that, I apologize in advance. I didn't know that was happening today or I would have made other accommodations. OK, so what I'm going to do is, I, again, just so you're aware of it, the problems that I'm going to do today, I'm going to start. In here on these um, exercises, which we call homework. All right, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these to do. All right, and I'm going to, I mean, this first one, calculate area and perimeter is probably the easiest, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the accumulate test score data. Then I'm going to do the calculate the factorial of a number. The calculate change is not hard. All right, so we will go over. We I will do um, five three the calculate income tax. Those are the only three I planned on doing, but we'll look at these other two just to be sure. Create a simple calculator mm -hmm. and add a method and an event. OK, so let's start by looking at a problem I'm not going to do, but that you are assigned. So you'll create a very simple form. All right. And you'll notice that it has four labels and it has four text boxes. Out of those text boxes, two of them are read only. It also has a calculate button and an exit button. You don't have to put in a clear button if they don't ask you to. If you want to put in a clear button, you're welcome to. All right. Now, I don't really care that much about the name if you if you do this, you know how you do that. If you call it area and perimeter, et cetera. If you want to call it extra four one with without any space in there, so extra four dash one, that'd be just fine. All right. They tell you how you how you create the area. They tell you how you create the perimeter. So I don't think that one is really going to be much of an issue for anyone, or at least that's my hope. All right. So let's look at the next one. We will do this one in just a minute. Accumulate test score data. In this exercise, you'll create a form that accepts one or more test scores. So this is your only input right there. All right. As you put in a number, you add it to a score total. You add one to a count. And then you divide the score total by the score count to get the average. All right. Now it says in here you should just assume that all of your input is good. I don't like that, so I didn't assume that. All right. 
So this is the first one that I'm going to do. I'm not going to save this. This will not be put in a repo. But I'm going to make a folder here that I'm going to call homework and labs. All right. Just made it right now. There's nothing in it, as you can see. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start up Visual Studio. I'm going to create a new project. It will, as always, be a Windows form. I shouldn't say always, but most of the time, that's what we've been creating. And I'm going to just call this extra 4-2, all right? And I'm going to put it into a solution called homework and labs, all right? And I want to make sure I put that in my desktop, in my folder called homework and labs, all right? So everything I think is okay. Oops, next. I did a back instead of a create. All right, so there we go. And I don't think we'll have to make this any bigger. So let's just come in and do what we typically do to start. All right, I'm going to change the back color here. And let's make it that kind of reddish. Let's change the name of the form. So it's supposed to look like this. And I did make some pictures of these. So this one is supposed to look like this. It's a score calculator, as you can see. So let's change the name to FRM score calculator. Yes, I want to change it all over. All right, so we've got that done. I'm going to add my three buttons, as I always do to start with. So again, I will have a calculate. I will have a Calculate, a clear, and an exit. So I've got those. Let's see what else we have on here. In fact, for the calculate, I think they had it up here and they called it add. So we'll do that. And I'll move this over and I'll move that over. That doesn't look too bad. All right. And then I need one, two, three, four text box, uh, four labels, and four text boxes. All right, this may be a little bit, but we'll see if we have enough room. Maybe a little bit tight on room, but we'll see. All right, there's label one. All right, as always, I'm going to Double click on the auto size so I can make it bigger. All right. There'll be two. There will be three. And there will be number four. Whoops. Four. All right. There's that button. I think what I'm going to do is I am going to bring that button down. It, my, my interface will look a little different than the one in the that's OK, really. All right, and I'll put my text boxes right here. All right. So there's my interface. Let me change the size of my font as I always do. All right, so we've got all that done. We're almost done with our interface here. All right, that doesn't look terrible. So let's lock it into place. All right. And these buttons, this one will be BTN add. And it will say add. And we haven't been doing it, but let's put ampersand add. So the A is underlined. So it's a shortcut. And for the clear, 
I'm going to call this BTN clear. And this is a matter of personal choice, but for the word clear, I'll make the elb having the underline in it. And then finally, for the last one, it will be BTN exit. And it'll have the X will be the thing with the underline in it. All right, so those are done. And then the things that these are supposed to say are score, score, total, score, count, average. So these may have to be made bigger. I've got a feeling. So. Let me unlock these. Let me move the oopsie. Didn't want to grab everything. I'm going to move these over a bit and I'm going to make these bigger. I may not have to do that, but I'm just doing it anyway. So. All right, so this first one will be the score. In fact, let's move these over right away. Also. The text align middle right and I'll make the text align for these centered. All right, so all that stuff is set. This first one is the score, so it'll be LBL score. And it will have the text on it of score. With a colon on the end. And this then will be TXT score. All right, and then what did we have next? Score total, score count, and score average. Oops, must have already named something. Score counts, so let's see. So this is TXT score, TXT score. That should be total, not count. All right, so now I can name this TXT score count. And this one, last one here, will just be average. And of course, all of this. All right, I believe I've got everything renamed. Let's take a quick look to be sure. All right. And it looks like everything has been renamed. That's good. All right, this isn't a hard program, as you'd probably guess. So this will be my add. This will be my clear. This will be my exit. All right. <clears throat> now for the exit. Um, let's do that one first. And it'll be the old exit program or not. All right, I, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to rewrite it myself. This will be a dialogue result. Dialog equal message box dot show do you really want to exit the program? Exit now.
Uh, this will be a Max's box buttons, yes, no, and it will be a question. Okay, that'll create the message box for us. If dialogue equal yes, application dot exit. All right, this is the same thing we've been doing all semester. I just keyed it in so, as opposed to copying it in. So let's do a file, save all. Let's run this. Now it's, I haven't changed the, uh, the buttons or anything else as far as accept button, but let's see if exit works. No exit, yes. Okay, that's a good start. All right, then let's do the clear button. So what do we want to do when we clear? First of all, these three fields right here will be read only. The only one that I'm using to actually input anything into is this one here. All right, so I'm going to set the tab order. I might as well do that next to one, I'm sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let's set that right away. So view tab order, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so that's done. So view tab order again. This up here for the form, it said actually on it, score calculator. So let's put that in. So that now is in there. Let's set the accept button to BTN add. And let's set the cancel button to BTN clear. And let's set our start position to center screen. All right, so now that's done. So what do we want to do here? What do we want to do when we press the clear button? Five things. Clear this. Actually, what do we want to clear here? I think the only thing we want to clear is this. All right, we're keeping a running total here, so we'll clear this and set the focus there. All right. I'll say clear some. So if I do run this and put something in there and move off of it and click clear, it's cleared. All right, so what's left to do is our ad routine. I want you to really start getting, getting to the point where, you know, you think about taking this and not putting everything in one routine unless, unless that routine isn't very big, okay? So there's different ways, as always, that we can do this, okay? But, okay, I just called a new routine called attempt to add score, because that's what I'm going to try to do. Now I could run it, <clears throat> but right now that routine isn't doing anything. So when I click the add button, button rather nothing would happen. All right, so what do I want to do? I'm going to make this very, 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 very similar to what we've done before. All right, first of all, we're adding scores. So let's, let's make a couple of, uh, let's come in here and create a couple of constants. So, I'm going to declare and initialize program constants. And it'll be pretty simple. Const int min test score, and that'll be zero. And const int max test score, and that'll be 100. 
And again, if it was a quiz instead of a test, we could always go in if we wanted to. All right, we could go in here and we could redo this. In other words, we could reset that to 50 or whatever. All right, well, let's declare some class variables. Remember, since they're class variables, two things. First of all, anything that we declare outside of a method is automatically initialized. Numeric variables are initialized to zero. Boolean variables are initialized to false. String variables are initialized to the empty string. On the other hand, if we create variables in here, they're local. They are not automatically initialized. So let's create three here. I've got int score total, int score count, and int, I make it a double, double average. All right, so those are our three variables. And the score total is going to hold what goes in there. The score count is going to hold what's in there. And the average is going to be this divided by this, and we're going to put it here. Now, hopefully that's straightforward enough, that explanation that at least, pretty much at least, made sense to you. All right. So in this attempt to add score, I've done this kind of thing before, and I'm going to do it like this now. So bool, result, bool, ret val, oops, val that I'm going to set equal to true, and int score. Now, what you'll notice is if I say equal zero here, all right, and if I come in here and I say equal false, all right, what I'm going to get, even though these are local variables, it says it's assigned a value but never used. All it wants to do is get rid of it. So let's do this. What we want to do is the new score should be in that text box. All right, so first of all, let's do this. If txt score dot text dot trim equal equals nothing, what do we know? We know that the score text box is empty. So we want to print out a message box. Let's make our own new message box routine in here. So we'll have a private void, go message. You don't have to do this, but I like to do it this way. String, it'll have a message in it and a string with a title in it. All right, then it's just message box dot show with the message, the title, the button, which will just be an OK button. And yeah, we can use information here. I, it won't hurt anything. All right, so that's that whole routine. Just set up that message box for us. So we come in here. If this was empty, OK, I'm going to call show message. And I'm going to say score cannot be empty. That'll be my text or my message. My title will be nothing inputted or score. All right? Since it's empty, I want to do two things. I want to give that the focus. And I want to get the heck out of there. All right? So this is verify that score text box is not empty. That's exactly what this is doing. Now we can save this and try this one. It's now empty. I get my nothing inputted for score. Score cannot be empty. Boom, and there is my focus. Now if I come and do this and click add, nothing happens because we haven't coded any more than that. So if we get down to here, the score text box 
was not empty. So now we want to verify that the score text box contains a number. All right, so we verified if it was empty, we gave it a message, set the focus back and return. Now we're going to come in here and say result e and it's an I parse. What are we parsing? TXT score. What are we putting the result in? We're putting the result in score, which we put right there. All right, now this is either going to succeed or it's going to fail. All right, that should make sense. So if it fails, non numeric input. We're again going to, I'm just going to grab this right here because we're doing a similar thing. So I'm going to say score must be numeric. All right, and I'll put in here 0 through 100. And there I wrote nodding, so I'm going to change that to nothing. All right. And here I'm going to say non numeric input for score. I want to give it the focus, but I also want to clear out what's in there because there's junk in there. So I now, now I should have handled in there. All right, what should be handled in there is both. All right, what should be handled in there is both putting nothing in there and putting something in there that's non-numeric. They should both be being handled right now. So let's double check and see if that's indeed the case. Again, when there was nothing in there, we get this. All right. If there's non-numeric in there, we're getting something different, non-numeric input. All right. So that's being handled. All right. So finally, if I get down to here, okay, if I get down to here, score text box holds a number. And again, I want to verify that number is between zero and 100 because those that was our range. So here we're verifying something is present here we're verifying that something is of the right type and here we're about to verify a range all right so if do it like this score less than min test score or score is greater than the max test score OK. We're going to say this score must be. I'm just going to say here out of range. Score must be. 0 to 100 and I'll change this to out of range. Now, I could have combined these two together. I could have done that into a combined condition. But what I wanted to show you was, again, there's three possible errors in here. The first error is nothing in here. So we get nothing inputted. The second error is non-numeric. So we get non-numeric input. The third one is an out of range. So we get out of range. All right, they all right now, at least they all appear to be working. That's good. 
So if I get down to here, all right, the score text box holds a number between 0 and 100. So what I want to do is basically set the rest of the text box values. How do I do that? All right, well, again, just so you know, I could have come in here and done that keep going and had this. And if it failed, just return. Otherwise, I could have done this. So there's a lot of different ways that you can write this, but there's only about a half dozen lines or more that I have to put in this program. So plus plus score count as I just added a new score, score total plus equals the score, and the average. Now, I, I wanted the average, they didn't do this in the book, but I wanted it to be two decimal places. So I did a double here of score total divided by another double of score count. Okay, and then I have to set up my text boxes. TXT score dot text. This they wanted us to clear out. TXT score total dot text equals the score total dot to string. So that's the score total. The TXT score count dot text equals score count dot to string and the txt average dot text equals average to string but i did want that to be two decimal places and two all right and because i'm squirrely this way that should be the entire program let's save it let's run it and let's see if it works Now, when you're testing this, test it with stuff that makes sense to you. 100. So this should now say 100. This should say 1. This should say 100. And they all do. And this cleared. And I, I should have put my focus back in there, but that's okay. All right. Now I'm going to put in a 50. This should now be 150. This should be 2. And this should be 75. All right. Looks good. Let's do one more. All right, I'm going to put an 80 in here, which will make this 230 and 3 and I don't know, 70, whatever that is, 76.33. All right, 76.67, sorry. But you get the idea. Now, let's see if we put in one more value and I just hit the Enter key. Well, that worked. The escape key, nothing really to do there. But I can put a, something in there and I can hit escape and make it go away. If there is no input and I click add, I still get my nothing inputted. If I put in non-numeric, I still get my non-numeric. If I put in, if I put in um, out of range, I get my out of range. OK, so that all works. It appears as though right now everything works. I want to add one more line, then I'm going to go over everything. All right, so here we did. I did set the set that, but I wanted to say txt score dot focus. So what that means is every time I run this, so I come in here and put in 29. All right. You'll notice that now my cursor is right there. So I can just put in another test. So it's kind of nice to be able to run it like that. So one last time here, let's check this from the top. And we'll go on to the next one. These things that are gray, we don't need. You can leave them in there. I also copied in here, I copied all of the comment that they that was in the 
PDF. And I like to put that up on the top right there. All right. Comment. Could I have written this in another way? Sure, I already mentioned that to you. All right. So we've got two constants in here, a minimum test score of zero, a maximum test score of 100. We have three class variables. They are class variables because they have been declared. All right, they have been declared right in uh, outside of any method or function. Without having to pass them in and out. Since they're class variables, they're all initialized to zero and double is really initialized or averaged to 0, 0.0. The, um, the clear is only clearing one field and setting the focus to it. Exit is what we've been doing all along. And the add, all right, we're calling attempt to add score there. And what is that doing? These are creating, so this will be a declare and initialize local variables. Now, I don't believe I'm using retval in here anymore. So I can get rid of that. You know, don't, don't leave around code if you remove something. It just makes it much easier, all right? If you removed it to, uh, to get rid of it. So we're, as it says, we're first verifying that the score text box is not empty. So we say text.trim to remove any leading or, or trailing spaces. If it's equal to nothing, we call our custom message box that says score cannot be empty. And it's got a title of nothing inputted for score. Since it's empty, we don't have to clear it out. We'll just reset the focus there and we'll return. So if we get down to here, the text box was not empty. So our second verification is we want to verify that it contains a number. That result is a Boolean on line 97 is a Boolean that we put up at the top of the page. All right, that's something we put up at the top of the page. And we said that it, you know, it was a Boolean. So we're going to attempt to parse whatever we put into that text box. If it succeeds, it goes into score. So if it has a number in it, it goes into score. If it fails, then result is false. If it fails, then we show another message that says non-numeric input for score. It wasn't empty, but we was non-numeric. Now we do want to clear it out because there was some junk in there. Set the focus and get the hay out of there. Finally, if we get down to here, we know the score text box did have a number in it, but we again have to do one last validation or verify. And really, instead of verify, I'll put validate in here. So validate that it's not empty. Validate that it contains a number. And finally, validate that it is between those values. So again, this is a presence or absence validation. This is a write data type validation. This is a range validation. So we're saying if the score we entered was less than zero or greater than 100, we want to again put in our, our specialized or custom message box that says out of range. Score must be zero through 100. Let's get rid of those parens because we really don't need them. We really don't need that either. There you go. And again, we're going to clear it out because even though it's a number, it's a non-valid number. Set the focus and return. So if we get down to the bottom here, everything was hunky-dory. In other words, we put something in the text box and it was numeric and it was a number that was between, it was a number that was between um, zero and 100. So 
we've got a valid score, so we add one to our score account. We take that score. Uh, I mean, begin play computer. We've now added one to this. Let's say we put a 50 right there, and it's the first time through. So this will be 50. That'll be one. We'll add score count. That'll be 50, and that'll be 50. If we do it again and put in 100, that'll be 100. This will now be 100. This will be be 150. This will be two, and that will be 75. All right. So what else are we doing in here? We we add to the score total and we figure out the updated average. OK. So I said set the rest of the text box values. Yeah, that's OK. That's kind of a crummy comment, though. So let's say here. In. Score count. Because we have another score. Add current score. To score total. And finally, calculate updated average. And I don't know, fill in text boxes, text box values. All right, maybe that's not a great thing to put in there. All right, but it works. Now, again, this is 175 lines. But I also put in here, you know, again, a lot of comments. So really the code doesn't start till about line 55. So with all those in there, all right, it's about maybe 120 lines. Okay. As always, if you have questions after this, if something does not make sense, it is your responsibility to ask me. All right, email me or whatever. So that's first one. Okay, so let me clear this one out because I don't need it anymore. All right, so that is my first one. So let me do a file, save all. Let me close this and let me close this. And the next one that I'm going to do then is this next one here and it's going to be factorial all right this is used in different kinds of mathematical calculations but for example 20 factorial just so you know and this is the answer i don't know what that number is so that'd be what millions billions trillions i think next is quadrillions i don't remember and i don't even know what comes after to something 432 quadrillion 902 billion i don't know but the point is 20 factorial is 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16 all the way to times one all right so as it says we want to be able to put a number in here between one and 20 all right if I put in a bigger number than this, it's just going to get too big. Like if I put 100 in here, that's 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 all the way down to one. You don't want to do that. All right, so we're going to make sure that the number that we put in here is going to be between one and 20. All right, so they show a couple of these in here, not all of them. But for example, it goes up to five. So five factorial is five times four times three times two times one all right as it says to be able to do this you this answer cannot be an int because an int has a um, the the biggest size you can make an int is two billion and that this is bigger than that all right so again i have copied the comments you don't have to do this this is just something i do so here where are we There are my comments for my factorial program, so I'm going to do that in just a second. Copy that to the clipboard, and we're going to start up a new project in here. All right, I'm going to close this. This was extra 4-2, so this new one is extra 5-1. 
All right, so I'm going to do a new solution. So right mouse click, I'm sorry. Right mouse click on the solution. And again, come in here and do that. And I want this to be a Windows form. There it is. I'm going to call this extra. 5-2 to make sure that I'm giving it the right one. I'm going to double check here. It's not, it's 5-1. So it's extra 5-1, not 5-2. All right, so extra 5-1 and click create. This has got a very simple interface to it. All right, let's change our back color. The last one was this, so let's make it orange. All right, if we look at this that's it we've got two two here two labels two text boxes this text box of course will be read only and i'll make my three buttons so i'll have a calculate a clear and an exit so two two and three this is called factorial calculator i think it was Factorial calculator. So let's rename the form to FRM factorial calculator. Yes, we want to change that. And let's come in here and let's put that in there for the text. Factorial calculator. There that is. Let me add my three buttons right away. All right, let's add our two text boxes and our two labels. About right. And again, our two text boxes. I think that's everything. Yeah, looks okay. Uh, I'm not going to lock it yet. Let's come in here first and reset the size as I always do. And again, the reason that I'm setting the size is as much really for your benefit more than mine. It works fine with everything at its standard size. I'm just making it a little bigger so it's easier for you to see exactly what I'm doing. All right, so this will be the calculate. The clear, whoops. The clear. And the exit. Let's lock the interface into place. OK, let's name these. So according to this, these say number and factorial. So this will say number, so it will be LBL number. OK, 
and this will say factorial and it will be LBO factorial. All right, so this will be TXT number. And TXT factorial. All right, let's go in and do what we always do, and that is set our accept button. To BTN calculate, set our cancel button. To BTN clear, set our start position to center screen. And these right here, I'm going to text align to middle, middle right. I like that. These I'm going to set to centered. Don't have to do that. All right. And finally, I'm going to set my tab order. The factorial is going to be a read only field. All right. So it'll be zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if you tab order, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. One more time, view tab order. All right, so that is done. This will be our calculate, which isn't going to be that long. This will be our clear, and this will be our exit. All right. I'm going to steal the exit from the last program that we wrote so we don't have to do oops, so we don't have to do that again. So there's our exit. And for our clear, we'll do a clear all. And it's pretty simple. We want to do a txt number dot text equal double quote double quote a txt factorial dot text equal double quote double quote and a txt number dot focus. That's it for that. So let's do a file save all and let's run it. See if those two work. Again, whoops, I have to set my startup project. So it is going to be extra five one. Set a startup project and run. All right. So I can't put a number in there. I can, I can put anything in there, but this is going to do, this won't do anything. But clear works, exit also appears to work. Okay, so the only thing to do then, the only thing that is left to do, all right, is to make that calculate work. But before we do that, let's put in a couple constants. So declare, and initialize program constants. And they're going to be pretty simple. They'll both be ints. So const int min number is equal to one. Oops. And const int max number is going to be equal to 20. That's pretty much per the program specs. Okay, all right, so we've got all that. And uh, when we calculate, what do we want to do? We Well, we want to calculate the factorial, right? So again, this is not a very big routine. So I wrote it all together. You didn't have to do it that way, but this is just how I did these. All right, so I call here calculate factorial. I get an error because it has not been written yet. All right. Very similar to what we've done before, we'll have a bool for the result. I'll have an int for the number, and that's the number I'm going to be keying into the first text box, and I'm going to have a long for the factorial. All right, 
and I set it equal to one. Whoops, to one. And you might say, well, hey, why did why did you do that? All right. And the last number that's actually in here when you go through the factorial process is one. OK, all right. So the first thing I did was again. Verify. I'll put validate again. I like that better. Validate that. Um, but, 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 txt number dot text is not empty. So if txt number dot text dot trim is equal to nothing. All right, I'm going to write another one of those show message things in here. Steal last program we did. And you might be thinking to yourself even, yeah, you know, with all this stuff that you're doing, couldn't we like, why do we always have to key it in? Couldn't we put it someplace? Yes, we'll get to that in a later chapter. All right, well, we start talking about things like class libraries. All right, so under this exit program or not, there will be my show message. Okay, so if this was empty, I want to do a show message. And I'm going to say that the number text box was empty. And I will give it a, this will say no number in text box. All right, so if that's the case, well, we just want to put the focus back there. So number dot txt number dot focus. And we want to get the hay out. All right, so that's validated that. So if we get down to here, txt number dot text was text was not empty. So here we want to come in and we want to validate. Let's validate them both in here. So validate that a txt number dot text is numeric and b txt number dot text is between 1 and 20. So we're going to do both of those. All right. So again, result equal and read that's this is an integer. So again, it's an in 32 dot try parse of txt number dot text and we're going to put the result into number. That's all good. If not result, or, how about spelling it right, or number less than min number, or number greater than max number. So if it's any one of those, Those are our error conditions, all right? If that's the case, we want to do another show message. So let me copy this. And we'll say number text box must contain a number one through 20. And I'm going to put in here invalid input in text box. OK, again, I'm going to get the focus, but again, I want to do a txt number dot text. I want to clear out because there's junk in there equals double quote, double quote. All right and return. 
OK, believe it or not, I'm almost done. But let's check these two first and make sure that they work. So file save all. Let's run it. OK, if there's nothing in there. No number in text box was empty. Invalid input must contain a number from 1 to 20. And the same thing. I'm going to try zero and this should fail also. All right. Finally, if I put a one in there, nothing's going to happen now because I haven't programmed it yet, but it is handling it. It is taking it. All right. Everything looks right now as though it's working. So if I get down to here. All right, then txt number dot text was numeric. And was a number between 1 and 20. So what do we have to do? Calculate and display the factorial. And again, it's not very long. All right. And let's write another routine. I didn't. I wrote it right in here because there's only five or six lines, but let's just. calculate factorial we really aren't calculating the factorial right there all right let's call this validate number text box because that's really what we're doing okay now we'll call calculate factorial and we will pass the number into that. We're getting an error because of course we haven't written that yet. So private void calculate factorial. All right, and we passed in an int, which was number. Let's just call it N. We can call it number if we want, it doesn't matter. All right, so while N not equal one, Factorial. I didn't make that thing for factorial, so long factorial equal one. I think we did that earlier. So now that we're putting it in its own routine, we don't need that anymore because we're not using it. All right. So long factorial equal one factorial. Time oops times equal number. So again, if we put 20 in there, that's doing the equivalent of 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16. All right, etc. And it just keep going. All right. Number. Minus equal one, we want to remove from one from it because we're going 19, 18, Etc. I don't know why I put txt number there. Uh, we want to say n minus equal one. So factorial times equal n. What the heck I'm doing? I don't know. Finally, when we're all done, txt factorial, txt factorial dot text equal factorial dot two string. Let's put it in there. We we're going to put it in as N0, which will put commas in there for us. So what is this doing? This is that factorial. So this value right here is going to hold whatever goes in here. All right. And we're basically saying. Keep going down. So if I put a six in there, it'll go down six, five, four, three, two, one. But then when we make we subtract one more from it, it'll be a zero. All right. In fact, we're only going to go down to one. Six, five, four, three, two, basically. So let's try it. The so file save all. And I'm going to run it. Now I want to bring this up and I want to bring up what was in the book here. Make this smaller. 
and I'm going to put a 20 in here and see if I get that god awful number. 2432 All right, if I clear and if I put 10 in there and hit enter, I get 3,628,800 which is the equivalent of 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, etc. And just for the heck of it, let's go in and do this. I'm going to bring up the calculator. Which is there, and I'm going to do this like this. So 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times six, times five, times four, times three, times two, times one. And we get 3,628,800, which is exactly what we got right here. All right. So we have now done, I have now gone through with you I went through what you have to do here. This is a very, that's a very simple program. We did four, two, and now we've just done five, one. All right, so what's next? This calculate change program, I'm gonna even give you a hint, and it, the, the same hint I'm giving you is probably in these instructions, but just so you know, all right? If I wanna, if if I put a number in here between, between one and 99, so let's say I put in 93, all right? How do I find out how many quarters there are? I divide the 93 by 25, which is the value of a quarter. And then I'll have a three here, and that'll give me 75 cents. So there's 18 cents left. Now, if I take that 90, 93 and modulo it by 25, I get 18. Then if I take 18 and divide that by 10, I get one. If I do an 18 modulo 10, I get eight. If I do an eight modulo, I'm sorry, an eight divided by five, I get one and the modulo is three. That's how we do it. It's just going to be a combination of divide modulo, divide modulo. All right. All right. So the next one, this one we are going to do together in just a moment. <clears throat> And that is calculate the income tax. So it's extra five, three, and it's an income tax calculator. All right. And I've saved this. It's going to be kind of ugly probably, but it's okay. I'm going to come over here. I am going to do a file save all. And I'm going to close everything that is currently open. All right. So I've done extra four two. And I've done extra five one. OK. So let's come in here and do another add new project. <clears throat> and this will be another Windows Forms app. So there it is. Next, this will be extra. I don't remember again what it is. It's 5-3, I believe. 5-3. <clears throat> this is an income tax calculator. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to rename my form. FRM income tax calculator. Yes, I want to change this. Change my color right away. I'll be a yellow. As always, add my three buttons.
pretty good. What else do we have in this interface? So this one's now done. Another very simple interface, although I have three buttons, two labels, two text boxes, one of which I can input, one of which is going to give me, it's going to be read only, a calculate button, a clear button, and an exit button. Okay. So again, I will come in here just as I have been doing. Okay, as always, let's change the size of our font to 24. Bold and that's not looking too shabby. I'm going to make this a little bigger. Almost butt that up there. And I'm going to make this a little bigger as well. like that and I think that looks okay so let's lock this into place all right and these say taxable income and income tax owed so this is taxable income so it'll be LBL taxable income and again it will say taxable income all right and this will be income tax owed All right, well, a couple things I screwed up on there. Say so it's got two eyes at the beginning. There we go. Nope. All right, so this does have to be a little bigger. So let's cut down the size of this a little bit. So we can make this bigger. And I don't like them butting up, so there we go. All right, that should be it for setting up our setting up everything. So LBL taxable income. This should be TXT taxable income. And LBL income tax owed, so this should be TXT income tax owed. Finally, as always, this will be BTN calculate. This will be BTN clear. And of course, the last one then will be BTN exit. All right, there's our calculate is going to go there, our clear there, and our exit there. Again, we'll do our exit program or not here. All right, and I'm going to again copy that in from a previous program. All 
So there's that. And in our clear, we'll call a clear all. Which we'll put right below here. And what do we have to clear here? This is read only. But clear, clear, focus. Not too bad. OK, so let's file save all. Before we run it, let's go back and do what we always do here, and that is let's set our accept button to BTN calculate, our cancel button to BTN clear. All right, and uh, t -t 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 -t. We'll set our start position. Well, they should say income tax calculator. And it now does. All right, let's set the start position. To center screen. Finally, let's come in here and let's do a view tab order. All right, it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And view tab order again. Let's do a file save all and try to run it for the first time. I don't think I did a save all. There we go. Oh, and I did not change my active project. So go to 5.3. Right mouse click on it and set it as startup project. OK, there it is. Now, if I come in here, put anything in here, nothing happens because the calculate hasn't been programmed yet. Clear looks like it works. And exit works as well. I'm going to center both of those because I just like to do that. So I'm going to set my text align to center. All right. Now, the other thing I want to do. I may or may not have mentioned this at the beginning, so let me get rid of the stuff I don't need here. I did put in the comment. I copied it from the book, so there it is. Pretty long comment. So again, this is basically in here. This is taken right from the book. So like the only reason I'm telling you that is numbers. All right, this is just the way that it was done in the book. All right, so let's see. Let's do this one, not a lot differently, but just a little bit differently. And what I mean is let's come in here and let's make our bool keep going. And I'm gonna set that equal to validate taxable income. OK. And really all we're, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a, in a routine in just a second. OK, so we want to validate the taxable income. Well, that taxable income. Let's make it a, a decimal. And we'll call it taxable income. And let's make another one. Called tax owed. All right. Now, Lou, it looked like you jumped on here, and that, that's totally great, fine. But again, if there's one thing consistent about this language, and this is not meant to be a joke, is that it's inconsistent, all right? I, I do like to come in here and say equals zero M. Now, sometimes when you do that, you're going to end a warning that says, hey, you don't have to do that. I just like to do it anyway. It's just the way that I'm wired, I guess. All right. If you define something up here, if you define something outside of any of the methods, 
they it is automatically initialized. Here, it's supposed to be initialized, even though some some literature says that it won't be. All right, so I just like to make sure. All right, because bottom line is, you know, if if I'll tell you, this isn't the story or anything, but um, if you're working on a software project, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're making a website, if you're doing a program like this, or you're doing something else. If you're working for a company and something goes wrong and you are able to actually prove that it wasn't your fault, it's the software's fault. Guess what? They don't fire software typically. It's your fault for not realizing that. So I'd rather go over and above what I have to do to make sure something looks the way that I want it to look. Like I said, that's just me. So I'm going to come down here now. And I'm going to do a private pool. Validate taxable income right there. All right, and all I want to do to validate it is I have to do two things. First, I have to make sure it's not empty. And second, I have to make sure that it's got a number in there that's at least a dollar. All right, because the there has to be some taxable income. I'm not going to put an upper limit on here. I could, but I'm not going to. All right, so I don't have in here. I don't have any constants, but I'm going to have a bool here for a result. I'm going to have a. Um, let's see, is the taxable income. Why don't we do this? All right, we're figuring out the taxable income, right? So I'm going to pass in taxable income as an out parameter. Which means that I'm expecting to set it in here. OK. So. We'll call it TI for taxable income. I could call it just taxable income. I am just lazy. So bool result. And let's put in here. Well, we've got TI already, so that taxable income. OK. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do this. I'm going to say. If. TXT. Income tax owed dot text dot trim. If there's nothing in there, then there is no income that's been put in. All right. So did I make a show message down here? I did not. I'm going to make this error. All right. Now, you never have to do this. All this is doing right here is whenever I want to put in a message box, there's less for me to type. That's all. All right. And I don't want to, you know, the thing that's bad about this is every one of these is going to have an error. All right. I could even change that. All right. But I'm going to just leave it the way that it is. And then up here, now when I put in that error, all I have to do is say show message and then give it what? It tells me in the IntelliSense here, it wants a message that says taxable income text box cannot be empty. That's my, that's what I'm putting in there. All right, so there's that. And now it's telling me I need a title. And I'm just going to put in here empty. Taxable. Income. Text box. All right, now the program is far from done, but I should be able to test that. I'm going to get an error when I do this. All right, and I'm getting an error. And if I put my mouse over it, it says, hey, you've never changed the value of TI. So just so I can test what I've done so far, 
I'm going to say TI equals 0M and return true. I just, oh, the only reason I did that is so I don't have any errors. I want to be able to test this. So what am I doing here? I am doing a, oops, validate that the taxable income text box is not empty. That's all I'm doing right there. So let's check and see if I do leave it empty, does the program catch it? So now it's empty. Empty taxable income text box. Taxable income text box cannot be empty. All right, and I've got, looks like I've got to put the um, focus back on there and I didn't do that. So TXT taxable income dot focus. There's nothing to remove, so I don't have to say TXT taxable income dot text equal double quote, double quote. There's nothing to remove, but I also don't want to go on because it was empty, so I'm just going to return right there. Now, it's a Boolean, so it won't take a return. So let's have a, re, a, a ret return value here called ret val, and we'll set it equal to true. And what we'll do here, since it's bad, is we'll say ret val equal false. And at the very end here, we're going to return ret val. Now, I've not really explained this, but you might say, why are you even doing that? Well, if you look closely at the at the code that's on the screen right now, what you will see, what you will see if you look on the screen, there's only one return statement. That's what you should shoot for when you are writing methods or functions to return in one place. I could have right here just said return false. And then down here I could have said return true, but then I've got two returns. And if I know that my return is screwed up, I know where that return is. So what I can do then is I can always come here, click there, and end up putting a breakpoint on there and checking it out. All right. So if I get down to here, all right, the taxable income text box was not empty. So what I want to do here is I want to validate. Oops. I want to validate that the taxable income text box both is numeric and greater than zero. I want to do both those. I'm going to do them both together. I could do those as two separate checks, but it's pretty simple. So I'm going to do it. I'm just decided to do it like that. All right. So I'm going to come in here and do my result equal. Now this is a decimal that I'm using here. So decimal dot try parse, all right, dot text, and the out will go into that TI, taxable income. Okay, you know this already. This will either succeed or it will fail. I mean, that should make sense. If it fails, Or if TI is less than or equal to zero, there again is no sense going on because either I have put in there something non-numeric or I've got a taxable income that doesn't exist. So in either one of those cases, I don't want to go on. All right. So I'm going to come in here and do another show message. This one will say taxable income invalid. And I'll let the user know either non-numeric or less than or equal to zero. All right. And I'm letting them know that. And in here, I'm just going to put in invalid taxable income. All right, again, I want to set just like we did here. I 
I want to set the focus and the red fail, but I also want to clear it out. There, there was something in there. So I want to clear out whatever was in there. All right. Now let's see. I should now be able to test this. You already saw it handled empty, but now if I put in something non-numeric or I put in something where the taxable income is less than zero, it should handle it. I should get the same error message in both for both conditions. So you already saw this. If there's nothing there, empty. Oh, it's running all that. So let's we'll fix that in a second. So let's see. Not numeric. All right, it's doing the empty, so something is goofed up in there, but it is doing the invalid, so that's good. It's doing that empty every time, so something is wrong in my check, so we'll fix that. All right, everything else does seem to be working, so let's look at that empty. TXT taxable income owed trim equal equal nothing. Show message. Rent, I didn't do a return here. That's on me. Oh, let's see. Okay, I can't do it. I don't want to return there. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to put this. What's the best way to do this? See, it's going down and it's doing this, even though I don't want it to. So instead of ret val equal false, I guess I will get rid of the ret val in this case. And I will just return false. There's other ways of doing it, but that'll be fine. So I'm going to return false here. It's a Boolean result. So what doesn't it like? It says the out parameter must be assigned. Well, I've never assigned TI, so I'm just going to say TI equals zero M. There is no taxable income. OK, all right. Now when I do this and I want to put here also a return false. And then down here, I'm going to change this to return true. Now, I don't like what I just did. And are there other ways around? Yes, but I have to write some else statements and stuff in here, and I don't really want to do that. All right, so let's look now and see if it works the way that it should. So if we put nothing in here, empty, and boom, there it sets that and we're done. We put non-numeric, it still says empty, so something is goofed up in there. Either that or my message is wrong. So let's look. It says cannot be empty. No. So I did all this, so if it was empty, I gave it the focus, I set my TI, and I returned false. All right. But I should have returned. So if I put in here something that is either non-numeric or is negative, I should be getting this message. So let's double check that. And it's still saying empty. OK, well, this is good in that it gives us a chance here. It's going to give us a chance to go in and actually do some debugging. All right, so I'm getting this message right there. So I'm going to put a breakpoint right here. So the program is going to stop when I get to that point. All right, so I'm going to click here. And in here, I'm going to just put in some garbage and I'm going to click calculate and notice it came in here. All right, so. If txt income tax o dot tax dot trim is equal to nothing. All right. Well, this value, according to this, it is nothing. So why is that? All right. So txt income tax owed. Let's double check and make sure that's what I called it. And I called it TXT taxable income. I don't think that's what I called it here. 
So that should be TXT taxable income is what this should be. Like that. All right, and that should be there. And it should also be here. Okay, now let's see if it works the way it's supposed to. So with nothing, empty, empty, there it is. With this, invalid, okay. And with something that's out of range, invalid. And if it's zero, invalid. That's all good. Everything in there is now good. All right, okay. So I have now validated the number. So if in here, if keep going, all right, and again, what that means is a positive number, number entered for taxable income. Okay, so I know that that's okay. So what do I want to do next? Well, now I've got an income, so I've got to calculate the tax owed. So I'm going to calculate the tax owed. And to do that, it will need the taxable income. Okay. I have not written that yet. I'm totally rewriting this from the way I did it originally, and that's totally fine. All right. So. But if this didn't work. I just want to return. I'm dead in the water because I didn't put in a positive number. So if it returned false, I just want to return. So let's do this one. This calculate tax owed. I'll put it right below the other one. All right. Now it needs the taxable income. So again, this is a decimal. TI. Now notice when we did this, it was an out. So we were setting the taxable income either here or here. Here, we're not setting the taxable income. We're just using it. So we do not pass that in. We do not pass that in as an out parameter, all right? So what this ends up being then basically is, well, what did we have up here? Okay, we've got taxable income and this is going to be tax owed. We don't need tax owed in there anymore. We can bring it down to here. All right, this is going to be the, the amount of tax that we owe. In other words, that's what's going to go in here. All right. And there's again different ways that we can do this. And the easiest way to me, maybe I'm wrong here, but this is, I'm going to show you how I did it. All right. And in order to do this, I had to use this chart. You'll notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels of tax. All right. If you owed, if you made eleven um, less than eleven thousand, so let's say you made a thousand dollars, you'd owe ten percent. So your whole tax bill would be a hundred dollars, and that goes all the way down to if you made five hundred and seventy-eight thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars or more, your tax would be this. Then we have to take whatever you make and minus. 578125, and whatever's left in there, multiply it by 37%. All right. And if you say, I don't get it, well, then just kind of watch for a couple minutes if you would. So I started on the high end and I said, if the income, uh, that's taxable income, and again, these are all just pulled right from that chart. And hopefully I didn't make any mistakes.
times 0 0.377 m. All right, so something's goofy here. We'll fix it. That should be a plus sign. That's probably what it is, and it is. This should also be 0 0.00 m. I'm working with decimal numbers, so I'm putting an m at the end of everything. So that's handling the highest end. Whoops, the highest end of my taxes right there. All right, then I've got the next one. That's 35%. Then the next one. And that is 32%. And this number is going to change. All right. And again, I'm just working my way down this tax code as it was shown.
And that should be everything. Let's take a quick look at it and then I'll go back and run it. All right, so these were just the comments. I have nothing in here as far as global variables. I have nothing in here as far as constants. I've mentioned this before, but I want to say it again as we're getting more and more into this. And that is that um, it's considered an OK practice to have constants in a program. Even if you're not going to use them all over the place, most people put their constants at the top of the screen. All right, right underneath this thing that says initialize components, so they'd be in here. And in this language, most people capitalize every letter in a constant, even though the Muroc book does not do that. All right. OK, you should always, though, on the on the other side of the coin, you should try to have as few global variables. That you define up here as possible, and the reason for that is if you have global variables, you can have what are called side effects, EFF, ECTS. Now, with side effects, sometimes that's what you want. I mean, sometimes side effects are a good thing, but what a side effect means is if something is defined up here and it's global, that means that any of these routines can change it, even routines that really shouldn't be allowed to. That's why you want to minimize and ideally eliminate having any global variables. All right, the um, our exit was nothing new. It was the same stuff we had done before. Our clear was just clearing out those two fields and setting the focus to the first one. Again, I made uh, my own show message thing in here. So everything that was basically done was done inside of our calculate. And when you look in here, what you will notice is I am I have tried at least I have tried to go in and use this calculate routine and create it more or less like a driver. Now I could I could have grabbed this all of this stuff and put it in its own routine. I could have done that too. Maybe that would have been a little bit cleaner. All right. And then just call that other routine from in here. That might have been a better way to handle it. All I'm saying is I could have done this. Bring that out of there and just say. Um, all right. Run the program. It's kind of a stupid name, but. And then put that in. And again, the advantage of doing that is if I were to come back later and add a menu in here, or if I wanted to call this routine from more than one place, all right, I could do that. Okay. Again, that's considered cleaner. We'll see. In, I'll leave it there. We'll see in a minute if it works or not. So here was our taxable income. All right. Right now, I should at least should be able to leave that off. I don't think it would hurt anything. Notice now that when I did that, when I did it before, oops, that it was grayed out. And if I put my mouse over it, it says local variable. That's all it says. But if I remove this, now the grayness went away. That confuses me. All right. I was always told that if you do this and then you come down here before you set this, if I were to come in here and print out the value of taxable income, it might work. It might give me zero or it might give me an error. So I like to go in. And initialize this again, as I told you earlier, I I want to take the credit if something works right, and I know I'll already take the credit or the, the blame if something goes wrong. So all I'm trying to do is cover my butt, you know, the old CYA. All right, so the first thing we want to do is we, this is our only input, so we want to validate it. It is taxable income, and we're passing taxable income in as an out parameter. We could have also passed it in as a ref parameter. All right. 
then what's the difference between an out and a ref? This out means that technically we are setting it in the other routine. All right. And ref really means the same thing. All right. You can look in your book, though. I'm sure they'll give you a much better explanation than the one I just did. So we call validate taxable income. And inside of there, we've got our bool result. In fact, now we're returning right here, returning false or returning true. So we, you know, if we had that bool ret val, we wouldn't need it anymore. We need result because that's what we're running right here. So I put comments in here to kind of show you what's going on. Here we are validating that the text box isn't empty. Do we have to do that? Believe it or not, the answer is no. We could have checked for it being empty in here as well. All right, I wrote two different little parts of code. This checked for empty and it gave a message back that it was empty. This check for something, it's it's in there, but whatever is in there is invalid, all right? Some people like to go and break it up so they've got all their different kinds of errors in there so you can see exactly what was wrong. Other people like to combine things. It's a matter of taste. It's a matter of the way that, you know, you may get to work at a company and at least at times, I mean, I, maybe I've, some of you have probably heard this quick little story from me and some of you have not, but uh, I was a programmer for about five years for AT&T Bell Laboratories, the phone company, which is now just AT&T. All right. When I got there, the first week that I was there, I had a guy come by and introduced himself to me. I have no idea what his name was now, but he put down this really huge thing of bound paper. You know, it was in like a kind of like a plastic folder and it must have had a thousand pages on it. And I said, what's that? He says, that's the protocol and this is how we write things here. This is how you write your code, etc." And of course, me being kind of a smart ass, I said, oh, that's it. And he looked back at me and in just a smart ass of a, of a way he said, no, that's volume one of three. All right. You were supposed to write things in a certain way. Well, while you're learning, you should write things in a way that makes sense to you. All right, I've tried to give you at least at times different ways of doing the same thing. All right, okay, so in here, again, we know it wasn't empty, so we've got something to convert, so we're trying to parse that. Remember how this works right here, line 117. We're attempting to take what was in that text box and parse or convert it into a decimal. If it succeeds, It'll put the result in TI and result will be true. If it fails, TI will not currently have a value. All right. So um, in here, then result will be false. So if the result was false or if we put zero or less in there, we're again showing an error message. And we're again returning false. If we get down to the bottom here, there's no if there, there's an if here and an if here. All right, we could have probably done this and made this an if and then made this an else. I mean, there's different ways of writing this. So again, if I get down to this bottom here, I put something into the text box. What I put into the text box was numeric and what I put into the text box was not just numeric it was a positive number, all right? So if that worked, so a positive number was entered, now we call calculate tax owed. If it did not work, we just return. And in that calculate tax owed, that's what we just looked at. And again, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes in here. I don't think I did. I would never try to do that but I have to go back and check all of these numbers. Since I'm working with decimals and these, when you put an actual number in here like this, this is known as a literal because it's a literal value. All right, so anytime I used literals in here, unless I missed one, what I tried to do was to make sure I put an M on the end. Sometimes if you leave the M off, the system won't flag it as an error, but it is possible that when you are running the program later, 
it could actually show up as an error. All right. That for some reason it kind of hides it. OK, so again. We keep going down as far as what you're making, so if this one's true, of course we skip all the else ifs and the else. All right, if this isn't true, we do this one. If that's true, we skip all the rest. All right, if that's false, we go down and check this one. If that's true, we skip all the rest. Otherwise, we go down and check this one and we keep going down until it finds a match. And if it doesn't, we use that one. All right, and then regardless, this is making sure that no matter what we put into this when we started, we're going to reformat it so that it shows dollars and cents. And we're doing the same thing for the tax owed. Now, this line that's in blue right here, it's a little scary, and I'm going to show you why in just a second. But I'm going to save this, and I'm going to run the program, and let's put a million dollars in here. This is not formatted. When I click calculate, this will be formatted. And I'm going to have a value here. All right. Now, I just mentioned to you that what I just did was scary. Because what I should do if I want to put in another value is click clear. All right. But I'm going to put a million. Back in there again. What some people do instead is they say, what if I made it two million? Guess what? This is going to break. And it breaks because we have in there the dollar sign and the commas. If I put in two like that, it's just fine. So, I mean, there's how do I get around that? Either I don't reformat it, or I make sure that after, like after I call it, et cetera, that I have this blank out or whatever I want. Now, we haven't talked about it yet. We'll talk about it later on in the semester. But just like in JavaScript, for those of you who were in that class last semester, you can use timers in here. So I could have this show for like five, three seconds, five seconds, and then just disappear. I'm not going to go into that right now. I don't want to do that. But you'll do no, you do notice, hopefully, that if I put nothing in here, all right, it's empty. And if I put in non-numeric, it's invalid. And if I put in a negative number, it's invalid. And if I put in zero, it's invalid. But I can put in a really big number here. Sooner or later, I'm going to put in a number that's too big, all right? And it's going to give me something that's wrong if I keep going in here, just so you know. So how do I get around that? All right. The way that I would have to get around that is I have to find out what that number is and either cap it there or, you know, try to make this rather than a decimal. I could make it a long, which is, you know, try to find the biggest type of number the program can handle. All right. We're not worried really about that. All right, I'm more concerned right now with you just having an understanding of what we're doing, period. All right, so what I've done during this time, and I'm not done yet, but just so you know, what I've done during this then is I've come in here. And I did not do this one. I figured you could all do this yourselves. All right, so again, what is area in this case it's 25 times 100 what is this? 250 it's 25 times 2 plus 100 times 2 that's all you have to do i figured that was simplistic enough that you could all handle that without any problem earlier today i did the accumulate test score data now if you missed that you're gonna have to go back and watch the tape all right i am not saving these and you are still required to do any homework or lab problems we do in class. I'm just trying to make it a little easier for you and give you something, all right? But if I put it out there as a repo, you wouldn't have to do it. You could just grab my code. That's not the idea behind this, all right? On this one, I moved the add button down here. I just didn't like the way it looked up there. Other than that, it's the same thing, all right? 
Then I did extra five one to calculate the factorial of a number. And I made sure that the number you put in here was between one and 20. All right. The calculate change. I mentioned this earlier. All right, with this one, and that is that, you know, I just I'm going to show you it right here. So let me move this over. All right, so let's suppose in here that what we put in here for change do I'm going to pretend for a minute, at least, that we put in here 93. That was a number we put in. So then we've got quarters. And I'm going to use the same numbers. I'm going to, well, it's not the same numbers they have, but I'm going to show you what they'll be and then how I got there. So uh, that'll actually be three quarters. That'll be 75 cents. And That'll be one dime, that'll be 85 cents, and that'll be one nickel, and that'll be 90 cents, and that'll be three pennies, and that'll give us 93. And how did I get that? Well, I took the original number that we had, 93. You can keep that and make a copy of it, or you can use that one. There's different ways you can do it. But I said 93 divided by 25, and that was equal to. Three, right there, I'm, I'm dividing a whole number by a whole number, int by int. So it throws away the decimal portion. So that gives me three, and that's this number. All right, then I took the 93 and moduloed it by 25, and that gave me 18. That's the number of cents I have left. All right, then, I went in and I took that 18 and I divided that by 10 and that gave me one. That's this number. That should be three, I don't know why that 93 there. All right, then I did an 18 modulo 10 and that gave me eight. Then I took the eight and divided it by five and I got one. Oops. And then finally, the eight modulo five, and that gave me three. So in other words, this calculation gave me my quarters. This calculation right here gave me my dimes. This calculation right here gave me my nickels. And this calculation right here gave me my pennies. If you can understand that, and hopefully you can by now, that's how you do that problem. All right. We just did 5-3 calculate income tax. We just did that one together. All right. So the next one is this. All right. Create a simple calculator. It says you'll create a form that accepts two operands and an operator from the user and performs the requested operation. All right. I'm going to show you how I did that one, but I didn't do it exactly like it is in here. All right. Why? Because I wanted to show you something we may or may not have talked about in here before. I don't like that. So I didn't use that. So let me show you what I did for that one. All right. And what I'm going to do is let's see I'm trying to figure out a fast way to do this hopefully what i'm about to do will work let's see all right i'm going to take this that i've got up here right now and i'm going to do a file save all all right and for lack of better words i'm going to close that and then i'm going to go to my solutions and i'm going to add but i want to add an existing project because i already have it in here but I, I did it under something else. So it's under calculators, calculators, calculator GUI right there. All right, now hopefully I brought everything in. We're gonna find out right now. 
So let me make this my startup project and let me run it and see if it works. All right, and I was just playing around with colors and stuff, so. Okay, it all appears to work, and if I put a zero in here, I just get illegal divide by zero. All right, so with this one, I'm going to just show you the finished product. All right, so this is what it looked like. It's pretty much what they had in there for that one for chapter six. But what I did was this right here, this is not a text box. Rather, I used what's called a combo box. All right, it's up here someplace. There it is. And when you've got a combo box, it shows you a list of options. And I've got it set up for two things. First of all, that it shows you the first option when it runs. And second of all, that it only shows you one option at a time. All right. So what I did for those options is I filled that up in my form load event. So this is the name of my combo box, CBO operation. And this basically is an array. And if you don't know what an array is, we're going to go over that next week. But basically, I'm adding a list of items. I'm adding a plus sign, then a minus sign, then a multiply sign, then a divide sign. And I'm making sure that when the program runs, it chooses the first one, which is the plus sign. So that's what that's doing in there. All right. Then, and again, I don't need this. I don't have the comment in here, but that's OK. You'll notice again, I have no global variables in here. I have no constants in here. All right. Now, I did everything because I was screwing around. This was right before class. So I would probably pull this stuff out and put it in its own routine, but it works. So for now, at least I'm going to leave it where it is. OK, so when you click the calculate button, you've got two decimals in there, so you can put in a pretty big honking number and you can have decimal places in it. Now, if I put in there uh, like 3.6.7, it's not going to work because I'd have two decimal places in. But if I put in 3.67, it will work. So what am I doing here? I'm validating the first number. And I'm validating the second number. And what you'll notice if you look here is I'm doing the same thing both times. This is virtually the exact same program. So what we're what what I, the reason I did this and to show it to you like this is that's what's called code bloat. What do I mean? It means I got a lot of stuff in here I don't need. What does that mean? That means I should be able to rewrite this and have just a routine call validate number. And then one time pass it in N1 and the other time pass it in N2. All right. I'm not sure if I can do that right now without making a mistake, but I'm going to try it anyway. So I'm going to change this to validate number. It's going to give me an error and that's OK. I'm going to get rid of the validate number two by just highlighting all of it. I'm not going to physically remove it. I'm just going to comment it out and I'm going to change this one here from validate number to just valid or from valid number one to validate number. And I'm going to call this N because it's my number. All right. And I've got a ret val here. See, this says return ret val. So here that's got to be N. All right. If this didn't work, this may end up giving me an error, but just in case, I'm going to put in here N equals zero. M. OK, now what did I just do? Well, hopefully you realize I've just replaced two methods with one method. It's generic now. Notice it just says text box cannot be empty and text box must be numeric. But I just got rid of 76, about 25 lines of code by rewriting 
It's also known as refactoring what I just did in here. Let's see if it still works. So we'll take something 25, we'll use eight. So that should be 33, oops. 25 plus eight equal 50, something's wrong in there. 25 minus eight, well, that's not right. Okay, it's using the same number, I can tell that. So because 25 plus 25 is 50, 25 minus 25 is zero, 25 times 25 is 625, and 25 divided by 25 is one. So I'm using the same number for both. All right, let's see if we can fix that. All right, so I called it here and I passed it number one, called it here and passed it in number two. All right, N, What I've done, my guess is if I come right here and I put in a breakpoint right there, I'm going to do that so it stops right here. I'm doing that on purpose. And we use 25 and 8, and I click calculate. All right. Now N1 is 25, N2 is also 25. So when I'm doing N2, when I'm calling that over here, out number one and out number two, all right? So validate number. Ah, there we go. That's the problem. I'm always checking the text for number one, all right? And you might say, well, Jesus, is there a way to fix that? The answer is yes. All right. And then very quickly, all right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back and, and unfactor it, so to speak. And what I mean is, I'm glad I didn't remove that stuff that was there. I'm going to make that a one again. I'm going to make that a two. I'm going to change this to one. And I'm going to uncomment this. And then I'll show you how we'd fix it. I don't want to go into it in too much detail because it's what we do next week. All right. So that should now work. So let's just double check and make sure that it is working now. So 25 and 8, 33, 17, 200, and what, three and a quarter or something like that? All right. So how do we fix that? Well, it's actually really simple, and we're going to talk about this next week. But notice in here we've got here's here's uh, txt number one, and here's txt number two. All right, you know that. You know what's in here. You know that this is the properties window. But there's a property in here that we have not talked about that can be unbelievably important in the stuff you do. So I want to show you that right now. I'm going to click, it doesn't matter which one, but right up above where it says text, there's a property that's called tag. And a tag is basically, for lack of better words, it's not, it's not the name, but it's a way we want to be able to refer to it. All right? And you might say, I don't get that. You will when we go over it next week. If you want a little bit of a preview, turn in your book, I think it's page 219. We're gonna learn how to write more generic methods. All right, but I wanna go back now and look at this. So we, we come in here and we validate the first number, we validate the second number, and we're doing them identically right now. Again, next week, we'll see if we can rewrite this and put it in one routine. Then we perform the operation. 
All right, decimal answer is just that. It's the answer. Answer string is going to be the answer, but it's going to be if we have an illegal divide, we're going to set it. Otherwise, it's going to be set to nothing. Like that. And the operation, this says that combo box we had, this says whatever the text in there was. The plus sign, the minus sign, the multiply sign, or the divide sign. Then I do a switch on it. If we chose plus, add the two. If we chose minus, subtract the second from the first. If we chose the asterisk, the first times the second. And if we chose the divide, we don't want to allow there to be an illegal divide by zero. So we double check and say, if the second number we put in was zero, we just set this answer string to a legal divide by zero, which means answer will be zero. And otherwise we said answer equal to this. And if this isn't true, then answer string will be the empty string. And I did that because I haven't really shown you many examples in here in the semester where we use that question mark colon operator. So I did it in there just so you could see it. All right, so this says if that answer string is not empty, then for the answer, put that in, which will say a legal divide by zero. If it was empty, then put whatever the answer was that we just figured out to two decimal places. This is not really a very difficult program. All right, and maybe by explaining it, I made it more difficult than it was, not my intention. If you want to take yours and do what I did, fine. If you want to make this a text box, that's also fine. But you are to do this one. All right. Let's see what else we have in here. Then add a method and an event handler to the income tax calculator says you'll add a method and another event handler. All right, so it says open it up, code the declaration for a private method named calculate tax that re receives the income amount and returns the tax amount. Guess what? I already did that. I didn't call it calculate tax. In the one that I just showed you. The one that we just did. Right here. I called it calculate tax owed. They want to call calculate tax good for them. So calculate tax. Calculate tax. There. Now I've done it the way they've done it in here. All right, move the if else statement down there. It is there. Modify the calculate so that it declares a tax variable. All right, I didn't do it that way. I just printed it out in there. So there's just, again, it's just another way you can do it. That's all. All right, so I'll let you work on that one. Now, the stuff for seven we'll go into next week. All right, so don't worry about that right now. So let me jump over here to the project. Now, this might make you very happy. This might make you very sad. You might not care one way or the other. I'm going to show you because I worked on this for a little while and got frustrated with it. So I went and looked at what the author did. That's the first time I've done that, but I did. I built the interface myself. I got the clear and the exit to work. I got to translate to partially work, but it wasn't totally work. So I'm going to show you what I what I did. You do not have to do this one. I am saying this, I will put this in the email you get today. You do not have to do project two dash one, translate English to Pig Latin. If you want to do it, you can. Totally fine, but you don't have to. All right, you do have to do this one, and I'm not gonna give you really any help with that one. All right, I want you to try this. It's probably the hardest one that you'll have to do. All right, it says you'll develop an app that lets student lets the user add students to a list, change the scores for the student in the list, and delete a student from the list. And if you go, I don't get that, you're going to have to go back and reread chapters, I think it's chapter six. All right, 
And if you try it, if you make an effort, and let's say you build the interface, you can fill the interface up, all right, your exit works, maybe you put a clear button in it and that works, but you're having problems with the add new, the update and the delete. If you show me that you've given an effort, you'll get at least a C, which is 18 and a half out of 25 points or whatever it happens to be. All right, probably that'll be it. If you do nothing, you'll get a zero on that. All right, and hopefully that makes some sense to you. All right, but I wanna bring up the pig Latin one, if I can find it. I think that's here. That is not there. Very little sense to you. If it makes very little sense to you, then my guess is probably you didn't do a lot of reading. All right, you probably didn't do a lot of reading. Yeah, I'm going to save that. Um, of chapters four, five, and six. All right, I don't know why that didn't come up, but it didn't. So let's try it again. All right, so this is the project. There it is. And you'll notice if I do run it, it works. So if I come in here and type in, now is the time for all good people to come to the aid of their party. And I hit enter, there it is in Pig Latin. All right, that works. The clear works, the exit works, etc. I'm gonna make this and this, I'm going to make the font bigger. I made it smaller just so I could type more stuff into it, but I'll set it back up to 24. All right, we'll run it. What is it? The quick red fox jumped over the lazy brown dog, something like that. Hit enter. There it is. All right, so I'm going to show you the code that went into doing this. And I'm not going to claim that the translate stuff is mine because it's not. All right. So the clear you'll notice is pretty simple. The exit is what we've been doing. Exit program or not. So let's take a look at what else was in here. So when you go and run the program, you double click translate. I've got perform the translation. All right, this I did put in myself. They, they, you know, I don't like it when the author says, assume that the input is valid. That's a stupid assumption to make. All right, and when you have your, when you take your test next week, you won't see that on one of my tests. All right, just so you know that. All right, so what do we have in here? They, I mean, notice they put an array in here, which they don't even get into until chapter eight. I just didn't like it when I went back and looked at how they did it. All right, so English is whatever we typed into that first text box. This, and I don't expect you to understand it. All right, but if you remember earlier, I typed in this. So I put in, now is the time for all good people to come to the aid of their party. All right. So when I first type that in, this whole thing right here, this is what goes into English. All right. Then when I run this next line right here, this string bracket bracket, it's I'm going to show you what it does and it may not make any sense to you right now, but hopefully after next week it'll make some more sense. All right. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 16 words in here. So I'm going to put in here words, zero, equal, and I'm just going to copy this a bunch of times. All right. So word zero is equal to now, and probably guessed this already, but one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. All right, why am I showing you this? Because what they're doing in here is they are separating each piece. So kind of imagine that this sentence is a pie and there are 16 words in there. So we're cutting the pie into 16 pieces. The first piece has the word now in it. The second piece has the word is in it. The third piece has the word the in it. I'm not going to keep going. And when we get down to the bottom, the last piece in it has party with a period. All right. Now, I'm, I'm not going to fill in the rest. I think you can understand what I'm saying here. All right. So. What this does is it says, OK, I want to take this string. And I want to split it up. How do I want to split it up? I want to split it up anywhere there's a blank space. And I want to take the results of splitting that up and put it into an array. And again, I don't want to get into arrays right now. It's the subject of chapter eight. But I want to put it into an array called words. And then I've got this thing called pig Latin. This, it's a different kind of for loop. We've worked with for loops. This will be an extended for loop. This basically tells tells it to run this on every word that's in words. So it'll do the now, then the is, then the the, et cetera, and it'll end up with party. And what this is meant, meant to do is it's gonna translate the word. It says translate word with caps, all right? So what do we have here? All right. Like I said, I figured that maybe I'm wrong, but this might have been a little bit too difficult for people to, to work with. So this is saying if the word ends with a period or it ends with a comma or it ends with a semicolon or it ends with a colon or it ends with an exclamation point or it ends with a question mark. All right. What they're basically saying is we don't want to include those in there. So remove any punctuation. That's exactly what it's saying. All right. Then th this right here is saying, hey, whatever word we passed into this, the now or the is or whatever, since we passed in now and the letter N in now was capitalized, it was an initial capitalization. We had no word that was totally uppercase. We had several words that were totally lowercase. So what it's doing in here is it's building a string called word. All right. And it's basically that's what it's going to return. In here into pig Latin. All right, and then it's going to go and it's going to put that pig Latin into the bottom text box. All right, there's a little more to it because this is how it's actually doing the translation. All right, what does this mean? It's checking it by character. If the first character in the word is an A or an E or an I or an O or a U, upper or lower case, then it puts way on the end. All right. Otherwise, if it's a Y like this, I mean, it's the pig Latin. This, these are the pig Latin words. This is just working with uppercase, with lowercase, and initial caps. Like I said, I figured that was too much to expect of you right now. All right. And we may go back and revisit this later in the semester. I don't really know. All right. The only thing I wanted to mention on here, so you see it, or I want to mention quickly, Two things. The first is these are both text boxes. All right. And they're meant to hold multiple lines. 
So if you want to have a text box that holds multiple lines, you set the multi-line property of a text box to true. If I went back and reset that to false, see how that changed? All right, and then do it again back to true, and it changes back. The other thing is you're used to, you are used to, when you want to put a new line in right now, we put in a backslash n. That does a new line. So let me bring that up in here. So if we wanted to do something here, we could just say, get rid of that. If I did like, let's just say I did a right line. All right, this was a console program and I wanted to say, um, hello there. How are you? And I wanted the hello there to be on one line and the how are you to be on another line. And then I wanted to go down to a, yet another line. I do it like this. So that would actually print out then like, hello there, how are you? How are you? And my cursor would be right there. All right, so who cares? Why am I telling you that? It's different. That works fine with a right line or that works fine with a label. If you're filling up a text box, you've got to put more than a backslash N in there. This means new line. You must also, also put in what's called a carriage feed. So for if you're doing this inside of a text box, you must do backslash R backslash N like that. OK, there's reasons for it, but it has to do internally with the way these things are set up. All right, I just thought I'd mention that to you now. OK, now I want to show you one more thing and I'll be done by 11 o'clock and I know I haven't. Believe me, I know I've been going for almost three hours and I haven't taken a break. All right. So. In this calculator thing that I showed you before, I just wanted to show you one thing in there. And that is. I wrote this twice. The second time I wrote it. I went back, I'm going to close all of these. So anything that's open, I'm going to close or try to. Let's get rid of this. So I went back in and rewrote this, and when I rewrote it the second time, I rewrote it as a console app, all right? Just to see what I could use, what I wouldn't use, et cetera. So if I run this, Enter a number. If I don't put a number in there, input must be numeric. Input must be numeric. So again, if I put 25 and 8 in there, again, if I put nothing, again, must be numeric, must be numeric. If I put it in 8, now it just comes up and it says, enter a 1 to add, enter a 2, etc. So if I put a 4 in there now, it says the answer is 3.13. That's all it does. So who cares? Why am I showing this to you then? I want to show you exactly why I'm showing this to you. Because it gives you a chance to see a few things. It's not a long program. It's less than 100 lines. All right. I still have my N1 and N2. I put it into an infinite loop. So I said while 1 equal 1. That's, that's a way of putting your code into an infinite loop. So I told it to clear the screen. But now notice. I do have just a valid one validate number. And I'm calling it the first time with an out N1, and I'm calling it the second time with an out N2. Why does it work? It works because we're not we're not working with text boxes that have their own names in them, etc. And the other thing is I put this into a do while loop, so it always runs at least once. So it says enter a number then attempt to parse it. If you can't parse it, write down the input must be numeric, all right? 
and keep going. But if you can parse it, all right, then result will be true, so it'll fall down out of this loop. So I can now use that same routine for both, for both, all right, numbers. And then the perform operation isn't that different from what we did before. All right, enter a one, enter a two, et cetera. And really what I should have done here, I think, is put another backslash N in there and then just said, Enter one, two, three, or four now, like that. That would have basically read a little better. That's all. And in here, these are the same things I did before. All right. But hopefully, one of the things that you are seeing in here, all right, hopefully at least, one of the things that you are seeing is that when you write one of these and you write it, you know, either in, all right, if you write it either in as a console program or if you write it as a GUI program, logic is logic. And it really doesn't matter, all right? It really does not matter uh, which way you write it, all right? I spent a year, I worked for an aerospace company as a programmer analyst, all right? And when I got there, the first week I was there, they, they said they wanted me to write this order entry system for them. And I said, what language do you want me to write it in? They said, what do you know? And I, I gave them about a half dozen languages that I was pretty fluent in or thought that I was programming languages. And they said, pick one, it doesn't really matter. We, we, we uh, handle all those here. So I picked the one that I thought would make the most sense for that and for that particular application, all right? But regardless of the language I would have chosen, the logic would have been the same. What you are learning in here is logic, all right? And you might've heard of things already, for example, like chat GBT, you know, and it's artificial intelligence. It's taken over the world. It's doing this, it's doing that. They won't need programmers anymore, et cetera. My own take on that for whatever it is or is not worth is that's not true. Is what happens is a thing like chat GBT can give you a good start. But as your as your applications get more and more complex, that's what it's giving you as a start. You're still going to have to make changes, additions, modifications, etc. All right. So. One last time. What you have to do, all right, you are responsible by next Wednesday, the 31st of May, 2023, you must write or create the uh, written tests for chapter one, I'm sorry, chapters four, five, and six, all right? Then from here, you must do Four one four two five one five two five three six one and six two. All right. And then from here, you must do two two maintain student scores. That one, like I said, if you have problems with it, all right, just do the best you can. Okay. Now, just to show you where we're going. When we get this section three, this is in chapter starting in chapter 12, but notice how we're going to change the calculator. All right, that's going to look a lot more like a regular calculator. We'll probably end up doing that one as a class. But you'll be able to build something like that. All right. What we're doing now is much more simplistic. I mentioned the other day, it's kind of the crawl, walk, run mentality. And we're still in the we're, we're going from crawling to learning to walk right now. All right, so you must, you know, what was due yesterday was the chapters one, two and three written test. All right, this was due yesterday, the chapters one, two and three written test, then extra two one and extra three one. 
I did the written tests in class. I did those two problems in class. I did them as one problem, which is fine. If you have not turned that in yet, you must turn it in as soon as possible. All right. I, it's worth the whole thing. I think each one of these was like it's 25 points or something like that. And each one of the written tests is worth 10 points. OK, so if you don't turn in the written tests, you lose 30 points. If you don't turn in these two, you'll lose a probably 25. So you'd already be 55 points in the hole. And when we look at this, I think these were worth 50. I could be wrong, but collectively, I think they're worth 50. And again, the three written tests, that's 30. And then 25 for the for this problem that you're going to be doing here for that maintain. So that's that's basically a hundred points. That's the equivalent of a test. All right. Now things come up, things happen. I get all that stuff. I really and truly do. Things happen for me as well. All right. But you know, I, I don't want you to fall behind because I've had this happen before. Typically, students that fall behind either don't catch up or they're behind the entire semester. Then they're turning in a boatload of stuff at the end. That's a good way to take an A student and make him or her into a C student. I don't want to do that. All right. So chapters one, two, and three written tests. And extra two, one, and three, one. If you have not done those, do them, get them in ASAP. All right. Four one four two five one five two five three six one six two, and project two two, plus written test four, written test five, and written test six. Those are all due by midnight Wednesday, the thirty first. We have no class next Monday. It is the Memorial Day observance on Tuesday of next week. On Tuesday, uh, we will be take you will be taking the second hands-on test on chapters four, five, and six. I'm, I'm writing it right now, and I want to be very specific in the instructions so there is no confusion. On Tuesday, I will have that test emailed to you by 7 a.m. You will have until midnight that evening to complete and turn in that test. I will also take from about 8 o'clock a.m. till about 8.15 a.m., going over the test instructions, and I will tape that. Wednesday of next week, we will go into Chapter 7. Chapter 7, we will talk about what's known as exception handling. We will spend the entire period on that, write several examples. All right, then Thursday, that'll be Wednesday of next week. Thursday of next week, we will go over Chapter 8, which is on arrays. All right. And then the following week, that Monday, I don't know what date that is. It's June something. On Monday, we will both have a pretest and we'll go over some of these select problems in here between seven and eight. There'll be one, two, three, four. I'll do one or two of them with you. All right. And You'll have a pretest. Then the next day, you'll have your hands on test. I will tell you what I'm thinking very, very hard of doing right now is after we get done with that, for chapters 9, 10, and 11, you'll notice there's one, two, three, four, five problems. I'm thinking of having us do 9, 10, and 11, all right, together, not giving you a test on 9, 10, and 11. I may change that. All right. But within two or three weeks, we're going to be up to chapter 12. All right. And it, the stuff, not a warning, but just to tell you, is going to get harder. All right. So if any of you have any questions, feel free to email me at jpscott at rankin.edu, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. All right. I'll be online until 2.30 this afternoon. All right. I will be online. But I'm not going to be sitting at my computer thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to look and see if now I got it's it's a minute later. Has somebody sent me an email? Oh, it's a minute later. Has somebody sent me an email? But I'll check it at least every 15 minutes or so. 
while I'm doing other things. So please feel free to email me. Other than that, have a nice weekend. Have a nice three day weekend. All right. Enjoy the Memorial Day holiday and I will talk to you next week. See you then.